Donkey Kong Country 2 is one of the greatest platformers ever made. The game's got everything you need in life. One, good ass music. Two, fun and interesting levels. Three, amazing apes. But that point got me thinking, what if you took these confident chimps and you made them instead mid marsupials, really remove the pep from their step, literally make these two dumbasses walk around through their entire quest instead. Since I'm always on the prowl to make good games terrible, I figured this sounded like a fun idea. And here we are, a walkthrough, get it? Hee hee ha ha fuck. Normally this game is probably a five on the difficulty scale. You know, it's not a cock crusher type challenge, it's made to be enjoyed. When you remove running, however, the things you suddenly have to start doing to succeed really moves up towards bowling ball to the balls territory. But I really just wanted to know, are there any levels that strictly require the run button? Did the developers intend you to actually use all your tools to their utmost or can you squeeze by with the bare minimum? Can you beat Donkey Kong Country 2 without running? DKC2 has an eclectic mixture of levels with a pretty unique blend of ground, water, and sky levels. Before beginning, I was pretty positive that every water level could be done on account of the fact that there's no ground to fall off of. Otherwise, well, that was the worry. Wherever there is a pit, there's a good likelihood that you can fall and die, and obviously these vary in width. Sometimes a tiny manhole is all that stands in your ape's path, but occasionally you've got to get the fucking pole vault out and clear a major gap. I've got a major gap in my ass after all this, I can tell you. Here's my rules before we get to the levels themselves. This this is Diddy Kong and Dixie Kong, but in this challenge they might as well be shitty and sucks Dixie because they can't handle much without running. Normally Dixie has the most broken move in the entire game, the air twirl, usable by hitting the run button while you're jumping. Since I'm restricted from using the run button, I'm also not using the twirl. Literally you can just beat the entire game with it alone, it's completely overpowered. And the developers did realize how good the move was since Dixie has inherently worse stats than Diddy. She's slower and has worse horizontal mobility while jumping, meaning that for most of the game Diddy is the main man. Also to clarify, the run button is Y, which happens to be the same for picking things up, which means that I will be pressing Y only for that purpose. You simply can't do most of the game without picking up items, so it's not worth restricting that as well. Unfortunately, when your Kong is actually holding something that isn't each other, you are forced into running, meaning that you can just bypass this challenge by picking up items and not throwing them. So as an additional restriction, I basically tried to not move at all while holding items if I could help it. I certainly also never cleared a gap while holding something, and as such, this hitch never really affected the legitimacy of the challenge. But you might wonder, what does running really affect? Shouldn't jumps be a static speed and height? And the answer is no. Running removes the dumpy, so to speak. The parabola, who here has been to school, that these two make when jumping and not running is really shallow, actually disappointingly shallow. It means that if there's a hook or a long gap to clear, you'll probably have to employ something fancier to succeed. And I've got a large bag of tricks to employ, but we'll get to them as they appear. And if you're wondering, animal buddies are fair play. They don't involve running, they typically just make the game very simple, but they're also not in a lot of the levels overall, and if you can't reach them, it doesn't matter how good Squitter is, shitter more like, I already made this fucking joke. Finally, this run was done on an emulator to give you fine people an input viewer down here, but I experimented and you can accomplish anything on an original console as well. Well, Pirate Panic, our first level, is definitely possible. There's nothing much that needs to be said. I imagine the developers thought that even five-year-old kids should be able to understand and complete this level, so the only jumps you have to make are tiny, nothing to stress out about so far. Although this level has a tutorial for one of the most necessary components of the No Running Challenge, the Tag Team Up. To accomplish this, you hit the A button and your active Kong will pick up the currently inactive one. This has a few implications for our run, or lack of run, get it? Fuck it. Just to mention, you don't actually move faster while doing this, unlike when you carry anything else, meaning that it's not going to change any jumps we have to make. What it does allow you to do is reach higher and farther locations than either Kong can separately. So if a gap is just slightly too long to be made while walking, a tag team up allows you to first jump into the middle of the gap and then toss your friend upwards, letting you stand on air for a second and then finally you will warp to wherever your friend lands. You can also throw your friends forward, but this doesn't let you warp to their location and instead you will fall in dead, splatted ape on the ground, next life. Our first great use of this technique will come soon, but we arrive at the next level first, main brace mayhem. Once again, not much to elaborate on. All the jumps are very doable. The only new thing to mention is that climbing ropes is also worse when you don't run. You climb slower both vertically and horizontally, meaning that enemies that occupy ropes will be harder to navigate around. But anyway, easy level, on to Gangplank Galley. Now here's something funny about Gangplank Galley, it's impossible to complete. Already, three levels in and there's already an unclearable jump. Up to the point where you will get stuck, everything goes swimmingly, just a lot of walking and our first mega fucking hop over to this hook. Only Diddy can make this jump and it's the first of many. And then here we are at the two hooks spread very far away over a chasm, neither Kong can make both jumps. Diddy can make the first one, but you have to run to make the second. Now discussing this jump involves like a million spoilers for how the run will progress, but we should go over some stuff that doesn't even work here. The tag team throw can be used to reach hooks that are awkward 
awkwardly spread out in the air by first teaming up and then jumping way too far past where the first hook in a sequence is and then finally tossing your friend vertically to the hook. If you aim correctly, you will snap up to the hook. However, this is always hampered by how these asshole developers spread out the stuff. Half the time you will get stuck on the first hook or the second one is barely too far. Believe me, this little aspect of teaming up does work for a lot of things, but here on level 1-3, it won't help you. The stupid first hook is just too low, dumbass hook. But while you're standing here thinking about how dumb the developers are, you might notice that the blue guys are coming over from the previous section and you get a few more options. Wherever there's an enemy or any way to take damage, you can perform two different tricks, both having incredible ramifications for getting through these levels. The much easier of the two, the damage boost, lets you take one of your characters, probably Dixie because she's terrible, and intentionally take a hit, which lets the other Kong assume control and jump in midair. This jump gets the spring boots treatment. It pops you up pretty high, not high enough for everything, but pretty good. It's almost like running. Instead, you're just using Dixie's face as a springboard, and as such, you'll only be able to do this once in a while. You aren't given an infinite supply of friend barrels, so in many places where this works, there's just too many difficult jumps in a row for it to matter. That being said, these blue guys are not coming far enough to make it work anyway. You can get hit, but the arc Diddy makes is too shallow because they don't walk close enough to the edge. But then we have it, the big boy, the best trick in our arsenal currently, a speedrunning trick that will help us accomplish many impossible tasks, the tag team super throw. Fuck, it's beautiful. Okay, so I'm not a speedrunner, so if you want explanations, don't. Essentially, here's what's happening. When you do a normal tag team throw, you get extra height and you think how quaint that is, but with this chunky fucking move, you just soar high in the sky, my friend. To perform this, you hit A to assume your regular tag team, and then this new step is to throw your partner at an enemy. This is how you normally kill things that are too tough to jump on, but while your throne Kong is retracting like a yo-yo, you hit and hold the B button. This makes you jump really, really high for some reason, and this means you can get to some previously unreachable locations, like this hook. We actually can clear this gap doing this method. It it's amazing. And then there's three hooks in a row, and fucked we are. There is no way to clear this. There's nothing we can use to actually make it through these three hooks worth of running jumps. There's no enemies or anything, so that's out. I also thought that perhaps this bonus game would put us beyond the final jumps that we can't make, but it actually puts us just before them. Again, thanks assholes from 30 years ago. Which means level 3 would be a stain on our record, except nope, there's a warp barrel in the level, and it's literally just right here at the beginning dog fucking shit. But that's wonderful news though. It means that we get to say level 3 is also completable as we set off for Lockjaw's Locker. As this is a swimming level, there's nothing too challenging to discuss. Swim and avoid hits, which is slightly harder because without running it's like swimming through lard, but you can quite easily get past everything here. I suppose I want to mention that bonus games and DK coins are collectibles that would be fun to discuss in this context, but truthfully most of them are unobtainable. You can get a decent number of them, like even the ones in this level, but I'll be skipping them unless they have ramifications for our completions. After this, we're at Top Sail Trouble, a level based around Ratley who can jump insanely high, meaning there's nothing to worry about. Even without running, Ratley has the power jump, the double jump the regular better than our jump, so just hop in his back and hop to the top, don't stop, bop and flip flop, bring these fuckers to the chop shop, don't flop, make it to the tip top, bust rhymes that bubble up like soda pop, you know, spit some bars and say goodbye to our snake friend and then get a taste of bees as that was only the halfway point, damn. For a lot of this, you'll notice that the jumps are doable, but they're very, very tight, you can't afford to hit the button too early, and obviously if you wait too long, you'll just walk into bees all the time. So a lot of a little annoyances later and you can clear top sale trouble with little hindrance as we arrive at the first boss of the game, Crow's Nest. The fight is based around hitting the titular crow with her own eggs. I mean, how fucked up are these chimps? She drops the eggs pretty constantly and Diddy can just hold them towards her and boom, you're winning the fight. Otherwise, dodge and walk around and this is probably our easiest boss battle. Now we move to World 2 and this will be our home for a long time due to one stupid fucking thing and we'll get to it soon, that's the teaser. Hot head hop is not too bad. The crocodile heads that propel you forward don't require running to make use of, and the level gives you Squitter, who is not a shitter. Third time, unbelievable, but he makes the game too easy. Since Squitter can produce platforms, you can ignore what the game designers even wanted you to do. Considering he can build a whole better level, it's really sad that he doesn't show up that often. In fact, you barely see him at all in this run. But take what you can get and build a pathway to the next level, Cannon's Claim. So here's a mineshaft level, meaning lots of vertical climbing. Funnily enough, this is okay, as verticality is less of a problem for us than horizontality. Barrels take us up at a pretty good pace, but there's a lot of annoying enemy placements to contend with. Since you can't run, enemies that appear with a gun will probably get to fire it. Birds will dive at you, and bees will travel in their lines without hesitation. With a little patience, though, this is not too bad. After this is Lava Lagoon, a swimming level I wasn't convinced would be possible, since the mechanic is this seal, the seal of cold breath, would cold breath into the water and make it no longer hot. If the water 
weather is hot, it hurts you, so that's not tenable, meaning it's a race against time, and fortunately, it doesn't matter. You're given an extremely generous amount of time, considering that these were the Battletoads developers. I would have thought that it would take frame-perfect execution to get through this gimmick level, but nah, it's really relaxed for swimming through lava. So, swim to your heart's content and arrive at Red Hot Ride. This level just sucks, it's full of balloons that's lame, and the physics of riding them over edges is no fun, but that's just criticism. In the context of this challenge, I don't even think running affects them, so just play the boring long level like everyone else does. And you should make it through okay. You can get Rambi here who just bulldozes things to death, so that's cool, and in general, animal buddies make life far easier, so it's good to get them when you can. Squawk's Shaft, get your mind out of the gutter, is a long and hard level, but it's not bad because after you traverse up the annoying bee-infested climb, you get to the main man himself, Squawks, and he rocks, shoot me. He's got the ability to fly, so you have no problem getting to the end of any level where he exists. The only thing is, running does help move around while flying, so it was harder to avoid the dive-bombing birds and the additional fucking bees, but so far so good, I really am feeling like we are in a good spot. We have just enough tricks that, while weird to execute and obviously suboptimal, they give us the means to get through anything. But I literally had no idea what horrors were in store for me. A level which is normally so easy would become one of the worst things I have ever seen. Welcome. This is Cleaver's Kiln. More like Cleaver's Cock. Cleaver is the second boss in DKC2 and he needs to be hit six times to be defeated. And let me tell you, this arena was my prison for way too long. Let me introduce you to what I call the six hooks. They are the only way to traverse the arena in phase one where Cleaver spawns a cannonball on either side of this lava pit. After hitting him, you have to move to the other side to find another cannonball. Now these are the hooks of the fucking damned, they are spread apart in such a comically terrible fashion. But before we get more into them, let's talk about Cleaver himself. Cleaver has two active hitboxes, his sword itself and his hand coming out of the lava. The sword is an active hitbox, meaning you can't damage him by using a team up toss. Believe me, I got desperate enough to try it. So you're stuck with hitting him with cannonballs as your only means of assault. After his slow barrage of fireballs, the game spawns one of them for you to use. And if you mess up by missing him or he counters your attack with one of his own, you'll get another one after he cycles through his attacks once again. Now hitting him is the easy part, he's a big ass sword after all, you pick up the cannonball and give him a whack, it's as simple as that. After this the six hooks descend and you have to get to the other side with him pursuing you. Initially I was worried about being so slow to move because he will follow you relentlessly in this phase, you can't get him off screen. But only with Diddy you can cross to the right side of the screen without getting hit. The jumps are very tight and you can't hesitate at all, but Diddy can clear the jumps. At this point let's review the arena. The lava pit contains no hitboxes, it's not like lava in a Mario game, this is really just a glorified hole. Probably the biggest hole in the entire game, but yeah, not a hitbox. There's some bonus coins in the top right corner of the map, but that's not something you can reach during phase one anyway. Point is, there's no friend barrels and vulnerabilities or hidden secrets. This level is six hooks and a hole, and cleaver of course. From the right side, I was optimistic because I already made it across the six hooks once, so I gave him another whack with the cannonball and down the hooks descended once again. I have a 14 line notepad document outlining what goes wrong from this point. Now the hooks are spread out in such an asshole fashion that you can't reach them well from this side at all, but that's fine as long as you can reach all but one of them you can damage boost to reach the other side again. For clarity, I'll reverse the hook numbering for now. Yeah, well, let's start with the side you can see. You already can't make the second jump. So you jump over Cleaver onto the first hook, and then that's it. They're your no man's land. But don't forget, you can circumvent the first and second hook by using a tag team up. So if you hop over Cleaver, you can tag team up to the third hook, and then you can't make the fourth jump. But we still have the damage boost, so let Dixie get hit by Cleaver, and you can actually pop all the way up to the fifth hook. And even if you couldn't, you can make the jump from the fourth to the fifth normally. And that jump looks so possible. That must be good enough to, I had to fuck it up. That looked like his fingertips touch it. Just a little harder on the jump button and you can't make this jump. It's such a robbery, but it's just too far. It's so annoying because look at it. It's just right there. But no, you are back to square one. Now again, there's not much to this fight, it's these hooks and him, and the hooks are currently out the window, so I started thinking maybe he held a secret, because this shit is just too disappointing to let go of for that. Well, considering he's an active hitbox, I don't see what we're going to do to be able to help over on this side, but we can try all sorts of- what the fuck? Yeah, so Cleaver can be touched if you just hit him, specifically while he's flashing still, he's immobile and serves as a wall essentially. So I started thinking, can I use him as a platform? And funnily enough, you can pogo off of his blade, so perfect, let's get into the teamed up position and hop on him and then toss to the fourth hook and sorry it doesn't work. I didn't know this but if you're in this weird semi stunned after jumping on an inactive enemy phase you can't act until you hit
hit the ground, so you just harmlessly skip into the lava. But that's when I realized it. Cleaver can now act as a team up super throw target. The timing on this is way harder because you can only get at most two attempts and you have to be really, really close to them. If you do it right, it's pretty close to a frame perfect input, but lo and fucking behold, it worked. I was so excited to see that you could actually do this, but even with the super jump I tried like 20 times, it wasn't going far enough. This was so close to working from both sides. Damage boosting got you so close, super jumps almost got you to the fourth hook. Something had to break. It was probably going to be me. After a long time of trying this, I knew the super jump method had to be shelved. It just wasn't far enough. I was resolved to find the secret to this because I knew if you could get that close, you could easily make it. By the way, if you twirled once from pretty much anywhere, you'd clear the entire chasm. How nice is that? So if you're on the third hook, the fourth one is directly above you, which sucks complete ass because when damage boosting, you now have to either accept landing on it because the game puts you on any hook your jump intersects with instantly, or you can go over the hook, which means you'll never possibly make it far enough to get to the sixth one. So I tried just leaping forwards and trying to get hit and it seemed like it was never going to happen. Until, what the f Fuck, he shot lower than he usually does. For clarity, my testing was involving using save states to just try in rapid succession, and it just changed randomly. Upon reloading, he wouldn't shoot low like that again. This intrigued me because if Cleaver shot a fireball low enough, I could clear the fourth hook's literally insanely long hitbox and potentially fly into the sixth hook. Through a ton of repetition, I found that his aim depended on your position on the screen, meaning I needed to trick the game into thinking I was lower than I was. I tried manipulating the D-pad, I tried doing things at different time intervals, and eventually I found the best way to do this was to do a tiny jump to lean forward somewhat and most of the time Cleaver would shoot a ball pretty low. It still didn't work. I tried hundreds of times and I found a few things. If you ever stopped your momentum, you wouldn't reach the sixth hook. It just didn't happen, either because you reduced your forward speed too much or because you now grab onto the fourth hook instead. Doing a wiggle, killing momentum did sometimes very rarely allow me to clear the fourth hook and land about one body length away from the sixth hook. I was punching my legs here, I can tell you. The fucking thing is so obviously reachable if you could just get lucky, but the weirdest problem I faced was that I was just moving too fast. The projectile could never catch me if I held forward towards the lava. But what about getting hit by Cleaver himself. Well, he's further back than the fireball is, how could he ever hit me? Well, remember, you can make him aim the fireball wherever you are, so what if you jump right instead of left? That means you land back on the third hook, avoiding the fireball, and Cleaver is still approaching. After avoiding the fireball, you have a very small frame window to jump to the left where Cleaver is A, going to swing forwards, and B, will shoot another fireball. This still doesn't work. He doesn't swing fast enough. If you could get him to tip your asshole, get your mind out of the gutter, you would fly past the fourth hook and towards the sixth, guaranteed but he just wasn't synced up correctly and it was pretty fixed. You can only do the team up throw to the third hook so fast without running. If you wait for him to become active, you can no longer make the jump because it takes too long to do the team up throw. So I tried fruitlessly to let him become active again after the second hit and then jump between one of his fireballs and the sword swing, meaning he'd be desynced distance and fireball wise. I got so close to doing this, but it didn't matter. His stupid ass hand would hit you as you tried to do the team up throw. Until my next trick. Cleaver actually doesn't have a hitbox under the lava, meaning if you time it very correctly, Dixie is immune to damage as Diddy flies up to the hook because she's off screen. So if you can actually desync his actions, I thought maybe my salvation lied with this discovery. Nope, still stuck in this shitty level. It never worked. I couldn't get far enough to make the sixth hook. He just physically couldn't do it. His swing was too slow. And if I waited too long, I'd get hit even earlier. It was finished. There was nothing. I spent hours here on save states, reattempts, new strategies. Nothing literally worked. It was so close, forbidden, a challenge you couldn't overcome. And me, I was overcome with frustration and sadness at the fact that I couldn't just bounce off Dixie's head and land on that sixth hook. This is still phase one, by the way. Phase two is completely different, and I didn't even know what to expect if I actually did make it. So Cleaver was impossible, just couldn't be done without running. Until I realized that I hadn't used my greatest technique yet. The 180 walking on air, pissed off, bleeding the motherfucking unbelievable tag team super moon throw that does just barely reach the fourth hook. Yeah, apparently, you can super jump in midair. I did try this a lot, actually, because I thought if I could start from here, I could make it, but it didn't work. I was using this reference from speedrunning websites, but they didn't do this specific in midair strategy. But yes, if you hold the B button and release it when Diddy is flying backwards to you, you can just in midair jump. I was so erect. After all this, it was finished. You could damage boost to the sixth hook and hit Cleaver for the third time, and then began phase two. It's actually super doable. Imagine that. All this time we were stuck on one jump and suddenly 50 hooks fall from the sky and Cleaver himself starts flying and all you've got to do is hustle. You can't make the purely horizontal jumps, you're just too slow, but you can make vertical jumps just fine to clear the gaps easier. Once to the right, back to the left, and finally to the right, and you have completed Cleaver's kiln without running. Outrageously fucking awful. And finally, world three.
Barrel Bayou is easy, at least after all we've been through. There's the necessity of using tag team throws to clear basic platforms, but it's not that scary. Just mind your jumps and you'll be able to succeed without hassle. Glimmer's Galleon is also easy because it's a swimming level. There's nothing to say, you can't fall, and these kinds of levels started really getting me into the groove. I was so excited after completing Cleaver, it made me feel like anything was possible. Crockhead Clamber? More like Cockhead Clamber. Unsubscribe is where the dream dies because you cannot physically make a particular jump in this level without dying. Isn't that anticlimactic? We struggled through Cleaver, we tried a million things because there was some degree of hope. This level, you ask? It's just a- it's just two fucking poles spread too far apart. There are no enemies, there is nothing to take damage on, it's just this. And yeah, can't clear that jump. It doesn't help that it's the last jump in the level, meaning that you get to feel the taste of victory just before whatever taste this is now, the taste of anal paste. It's actually a miracle you can even get here. The whole level is comprised of jumping on cattails, and it's dicey the entire way, but there's always a surplus of enemies or platforms, so you never got stuck. But when you're normally expected to celebrate a job well done with an enemy-free jump, you instead swear raucously. Because really, why couldn't they have put one more bird here? So, let us frown together and add one to the tally. The first level you cannot beat without running. It's always dumbass bog levels, I swear to god. But Rattle Battle involves Ratley again, so it's easy. Some of the jumps are harder than the last time we saw him, but you just have to be more careful and use a super jump or two and you'll make it out of here, you know, back on a pleasant streak. Slime Climb is a very challenging level because you have to move your slow ass chimp quite quick. There's a constantly rising layer of water that contains a mean fish, the meanest fish, and you really can't hang around. And since there's a million ropes, you need to employ another trick where you jump off of ropes to get around quicker than just slowly climbing on them. But fortunately for all the challenging maneuvering around bees and stuff you have to do, there's a lot of helpful power-ups, blast barrels, and vulnerabilities, stuff that eases the pain. A segment near the end involves a really thin margin of error where you have to navigate past the blue guy while the water rises. As Dixie, this sucked to actually do. Again, more evidence that Diddy is the supreme being when you spend your time walking around. But it is doable, and after that is a little jaunt to the finish line, and you have completed Slime Climb. Bramble Blast is a barrel level, meaning that you don't even have to do much ordinarily. That's good because I could use a break after all these levels that have broken my hands. Since there's no way to fall and the level's all about timing correctly, time correctly and you'll beat Bramble Blast. After this, we're back to another boss, Cudgel's Contest. He is easy as pie. I've eaten pies harder than him. Piece of pie. You get the picture. He jumps around and you need to jump when he lands on the ground or you'll get stunned even when walking. He isn't fast enough to squash you if you're paying attention. After Cleaver, this is a very enjoyable encounter, just throwing bombs at this crockhead. So to this point, only one level has proven impossible, and it's disappointing because it looks like it shouldn't be, but as far as this low intellect, huge donged YouTuber could see, there's no way to clear the last jump in crockhead clamber. But you know what? Not so bad. We can keep going on to World 4 with Horn it whole. Whole lot of bees in here more like, and unfortunately this is the first honey level of the run. But funnily enough, honey, the normally awful component of any level in the game, is one of the only ways for us to get up to regular running speed without running. Here's what I mean, if you are stuck in honey, either on the ground or a wall, you can no longer move via the d-pad, you have to jump off in order to free yourself. When you do this off of a wall, the momentum you gain is max speed, meaning you can kind of play like you're playing normally. That doesn't mean you can actually do this level if Squitter wasn't here, because just as Diddy and Dixie you have to take way too many any damage boosts to get by, but since we do get the big squid, we can easily roam to the end of this level. Target Tear, the very first of the roller coaster levels, is on autopilot pretty much and therefore is very doable. This makes me happy, very good. I must admit, I don't remember and I didn't try it because I was just obviously not doing it, but I'm not sure that running even affects this kind of level, so yeah, maybe, maybe nothing changed at all. Now, Bramble Scramble is an interesting one because you are obligated to start with both Kongs or else you can't even begin. That's not against the rules or anything, it's just a bit novel. The reason for this is that you cannot make the first jump without a tag team throw. There's even a friend barrel right over there, but you simply cannot make a walking jump over this gap. After this, you have to perform another interesting maneuver by picking up the friend barrel and damage boosting over this gap, meaning that Dixie dies, but she was holding herself the entire time, my god. And then you can get through here to the point where a tag team gives you an invulnerability and then you can find 
finally get the squawks and the game is easy once again. I actually didn't realize the picking up the friend barrel while you had both Kongs thing, so I tried doing these jumps solo several times and you can actually use a beetle to barely clear this first jump, but then you're stuck one platform short if you're alone, so that's a disappointment. But yeah, anyway, flying makes the game simple and gets us on to rickety race. As another roller coaster level, you don't even have to think very much. Just time your jumps as any player would, and you're moving on once again. This streak of easy levels really makes me hate Crockhead Clamber even more. But now, Mudhole Marsh is a level that I thought was also impossible because it requires a ton of annoying problem solving. Things feel fine for about 13 seconds and then you come to this part with six hooks. Fucking six hooks again. Now you can't actually clear the second to third or third to fourth hook jumps with either character. You're just screwed. And no damage boost could take you far enough to make it otherwise. So yeah, besides being despondent that I was trying to figure out this kind of thing again, I also neglected this cat of nine tails that was sitting here. First, I did the Chad thing and tried to 180 walk in air pistol off bleeding the motherfucking unbelievable tag team super moon throw off the cat of nine tails and you know what that probably would have worked eventually because it nearly got me to the fourth hook but the easier thing to do is to remember that this enemy instead tosses you far into the air so literally just like land on them and yeah wow that's that's remarkably easier so you actually get to the fourth hook fairly easily take a damage boost and bobs your uncle you've cleared this pit there's also a friend barrel in one of these chests so you just move forward get dixie back and progress towards yet another pitfall this unreachable cattail jump again i told you it's always bog levels the only fun part is that there is a way to do this, but it's really weird. You first have to jump really far forward and tag team throw back to where you came. A bird spawns past the jump we can't make and flies towards us. Now you can take a damage boost once again and you'll make the jump. And now every other cattail jump here has a bird waiting to be folded like an omelet, which serves as platforms. After this, the level is still very hard, but completely doable. You have to be extra cautious with the section where a barrel bridge is formed for you, and if you do it correctly, you have made it. And now we're at another seemingly impossible level of Rambi Rumble. Now, this is the B level. It's just swarming with them. And to make matters worse, you don't get Rambi until a bit in, so you're just stuck with these two. And these two stink. Once I came to this particular jump, this is where I thought it was impossible because you need to not lose a character this early on. But of course, the jump is too long and the B is too big. This was the fun part, though. If you go up towards a bonus game located at the top left of this room, you can jump from a super high height towards the wall with the B, and it's still too far. But if you take into account the foe running from jumping off of the honey walls, like the one right next to the bonus game, you can make the jump very comfortably. Now we're playing with bullshit. After that, I'm faced with the same kind of thing, but obviously I'm in no man's land with no platform to jump off of. Doing a tag team up to clear this gap doesn't work, it's just too high. But there is an enemy, so a super jump later, and boy, it's a stretch, but you can pop all the way up to this platform. After this, you get to be Rambi, and as previously mentioned, he slams ass. So the rest of the level is straightforward. The segment where you try to flee from King Sting is funny because you have no chance to outrun him, but he just keeps going. So you just take a hit, and you're safe from him for the rest of the race. And then we can enter his arena in King Zing Sting. He's easy as cake, piece of cake, piece of shit, because all you have to do is fly around and shoot a stinger with squawks, and since flying is obviously not hard for us to do, we tackle this fight much like a regular player would. Goodbye, B-Man. And then we reach the most obviously impossible challenge so far. Ghostly Grove is not possible. It's not even close. In fact, if I ranked the two levels we couldn't complete up to this point, counting this one, Crockett Clamber is 99% doable and Ghostly Grove is approximately 8% doable. The problem we're facing comes early, but it also comes often because while this double ghost rope is what we're failing to here as it's just too spread out, as well as having ledges with potential enemies way too far away to use for either boosting or super jumping, it doesn't end only here. So many segments are too long to make without running to each rope. Not even that either, but the ghost ropes have the added challenge of vanishing, meaning that slow speed is also going to make this impossible. The final part of the level involves five ropes that you can't jump between over what is probably now the largest chasm in the game. Unfortunately, this is another point where you must run, but we can be satisfied that this level we've only had to concede twice. And on to Haunted Hall with our heads hung low. Fucking bandana skeletons, I've got a scary mouse car. What do you have, doors? Well, you should have hidden these barrels behind the doors because you're getting boosted on. What the fuck am I talking about? Yeah, easy level once again. Thank you, game. And oh boy, it's now Ghosty Gladit. 
Normally a very weird gimmick level with wind that pushes you forwards or backwards. That's actually a big advantage for me since I can get way further than I can with regular jumps, but it's sometimes still not enough. These pits are designed to be very large and even with the wind I needed to team up throw to clear the rest of the way. Ah, that's a bit it. That, that's a bit it. Uh, that's a bit it. That's a bit it. Uh, what? That's about it though. Most of the challenge comes from being careful more than anything else. And while I did fall and die a good number of times, this was another very feasible stage to complete. Parrot shoot panic is easy as well because you now have squawks, friend, brother, son. I don't know who this bird is supposed to be, but they can't fly. You know, they suck. So you just descend down slowly and that's, that makes life very simple. Fall and find yourself in web woods. This is another infamous level for regular players because it's a long level full of fog and squitter mechanics and that's the guy we love to see as, yeah, he makes the level trivial. Him and all his shoes, what a guy. Just make platforms and walk your way over to Creepy Crow who is less creepy and more of a fucker. The mechanics are simple, but without running it becomes tedious to dodge his attacks. You have to hit him three times, and each time you do hit him, a new ascending series of ropes and platforms open up. As you climb, eggs follow your position, and yeah, it makes it much harder to survive. Normally, getting hit would be a you problem, but with our rules, there isn't really much you can do to avoid being clonked. Fortunately, you are given a friend barrel halfway up, so you can make one mistake and still live to tell the tale. Yeah, so Creepy Crow thrown away, and we are in the final real world. K Rules Keep opens up with Arctic Abyss and Enguard level, holy shit. Enguard has great mobility in the water, even when you're not running, so taking things slowly, it wasn't so bad. You can just swim, you know, so no deaths here, bucko. I did actually die several times due to the lack of real estate, but that's less to do with the rules and more to do with my brain making e roars, so forgive me as I take you to Windy Well. You gotta start with both Kongs once again, as the jumps are a bit too dubious to make otherwise. Hold on, I'm taking a sip of water. Once you're out of the start, there's a lot of upwards wind. It's like Oklahoma or something around here. This is great news because it removes the potential for falling. You do have to be a pretty good player to do this, but we're in the home stretch now. I can smell victory. I'm holding out hope that there's only two levels that cannot be completed. Castle Crush is another auto-scroller. The only difference is that you're constantly moving upwards. There's a lot of tight spots to contend with, many of which involve killing enemies before they impede your path. That being said, there is fortunately enough friend barrels to make your way through tough moments. There are three points with porcupines, and getting around them without taking hit requires fast throwing to dispatch, and some of them are impossible. Although while hard, it's nothing that cannot be done. Clapper's Cavern, on the other hand, It's also completely doable, clappers this level's cheeks, I did, but it's one of the hardest levels to actually do so. There's just shit everywhere, man. It's a gauntlet of tough sections with annoying air, ground, and sea enemies, and invulnerability helps to get past a lot of the irksome parts, but I had to restart the level a lot of times to get through the muck. Especially this B section, goddamn, you just have to slide and jump with the ice physics just right, and if you do do this, you can move on to chain link chamber. There's a lot of chain climbing and a lot of bees and projectiles and slow Diddy Kong. It's not a fun time. The level is normally not very fun anyway, and the rule set certainly doesn't help. Once you get to the part with bees and no invulnerability, it's downhill from there. You have to become Neo himself. The cannonballs falling isn't simple in the final section. Now that one is quite simple. Just jump up and jump down quickly. Good for you. That's chain link chamber. Toxic Tower is an iconic level in DKC2. It's probably the hardest non-secret stage in the game. You have to ascend quickly from a constantly rising pool of acid. The only saving grace is that there's a ton of animal buddies here, starting with Ratley. He is broken, so you can beat section one just by jumping correctly. And then it's Squitter, who's even easier to use. And actually, looking at this closer, maybe Toxic Tower isn't all that bad. I mean, I did die like seven times total, so you know what? Whatever. Great. Fuck it. Stronghold Showdown is a fake level and just plays a cutscene. Thank God we got through that one. Also, we are at the final regular level. Don't worry, I'll also do the Lost World, but for now, it's Screech's Sprint and it's not fucking possible. So yeah, the level is a bramble type deal, you know, with a lot of the ground that hurts you, and there's some really specific jumps to make early on. So specific, I didn't even think you could make them, but they are indeed possible. Like this part with the TNT clobber, you gotta bounce on his head and go right through the hole, and if you don't do that, well, there's no way to get through there otherwise. And for a level with squawks, everything was looking great until the four Bs. Hate these bastards. These four travel up and down over this here rope. Now, I slowed the game down to like 1% and did this as frame perfectly as I possibly could. Believe me, you cannot make it. If you're climbing slowly, you just can't get 
get through all four Bs. And you might be thinking, who cares? You have both characters, just take a hit. And yeah, sure, that's fine. You can take the hit, but you do need to do tag team throws to clear the final section before squawks. That or roll jump, which requires running. So, you know, that's not happening. The space you're given is just not enough to clear the Bs without losing someone. I tried jumping, sitting between the Bs, doing weird stuff, and nothing worked. The last thing you could even try to do is employ the moonwalk and get the Bs on screen early and throw the chest from the previous room at one of them, which would make the climb possible, but there's sadly no way to get the chest to reach the Bs. You can get the chest near the Bs, but there's no floor, so you can't pick it back up without taking a hit. If there was a friend barrel in the chest, we'd have a ball game, but there's only some useless thick bananas. This one still feels like there's some arbitrary secret to accomplish it. I I wouldn't rule it completely out, but it appears that it's quite solidly undoable. There's also a race component to this level, which involves getting to the goal faster than this evil bird Screech, and I wondered if that would also be impossible, but even if you couldn't beat him due to your reduced speed, you can just skip the race with a damage boost anyway, so it would be possible. Sad day, move the counter up to 3. And get Prime to move it to 4 because it's K rule time. The only way to hurt Captain K. Rule is by having him suck your balls, but he'll only do that after you buy him dinner and you dodge his barrage of attacks. Jumping over him is harder without running, but not impossible. There are plenty of moments where you'd like to avoid him and throw the cannonballs in different ways, but walking reduces our options. Segments with the spike balls are harder to navigate, especially this one with the spiral balls. You have to weave in between the attack, which is a bit nutty. After this, there isn't actually much to worry about except for the very last attack he unleashes. He becomes invisible and warps around the arena and starts sucking you. Get your mind out of the gun because that's the only way you're going to stay alive. As he activates his vortex ability, you're supposed to run in the opposite direction and you'd survive the attack quite easily. But yeah, as always, walking. Here you have to be a remarkably far distance away from him to avoid getting pulled in. I was expecting this to be frankly impossible, but you can actually avoid this attack by walking. I'm not sure it's really feasible to do this without at least losing one Kong, but I made it and down comes Donkey to ape punch this King K fool and with that you can complete every boss battle. Uh, well, except I haven't actually talked about the Lost World yet. The Lost World is a set of levels only accessible by completing every bonus game, with each world hosting a different kind of level. These are the big boys. They are way harder than the usual fare. Not only are they tediously long, they're chock full of tough segments, roll jumps, long jumps, various other jumps. So let's hit them up. This is the final stretch. Animal Antics is a long trek where you have to utilize all of your animal buddies to get through various segments, but that's funnily enough why it's probably the easiest Lost World level, because Squitter squats all over the game as does the other animal troops. While certainly not easy, you don't need to run to complete Animal Antics. Fiery Furnace is the Lost World volcano level and it burns my ass hair. It's full of tough jumps requiring several team throws and a lot of careful planning. Past a lot of annoyances came the only part that required a little more oomph for the super throw because these two bees were just too high to jump over and a regular team up toss wouldn't be enough. Believe me, I tried. Fortunately, this mosquito was just sitting here, a godsend, because without it, this would be another probably impossible jump. I didn't try every orientation of damage boosting, but I don't think that would be quite enough. But forget it. Fortunately, Fiery Furnace did not fuck up our run. And then we get to look at Clobber Carnage, a level full of clobbers, which sucks. And, you know, what doesn't suck is that the level has a lot of barrels and easy to reach areas, so you're not even really required to jump very much. Since this is a lost level, though, you really need the team up toss for some things, so losing Diddy or Dixie is almost certain doom. But overall, this was not a humongous hangup. Black Ice Battle is next, and it really does suck. There's a lot of enemies here, so many, in fact, that you're probably going to take hits. Walking on ice sucks, loads of bees sucks, it just sucks. The good news is that there's no way to fall to your death here, so it's all about mitigating damage. And if you're very, very good, you can get through here without taking too many hits. And finally, Jungle Jinx. Now this level is not the longest, but it's very annoying. You have to bounce on tires that roll over spike traps, and if you're not fast enough, you will fall behind and probably just die. It's a good thing we're mandated to move so slowly. In the end though, it's not required to run. Fancy that, the entire Lost World completed without much opposition. With these levels completed, it leaves only one last thing, the true final boss, Captain K Rule 2. Captain K. Fuck is back with only one point of life. If you can manage to endure his barrages of cannonballs and status ailments, you can beat the game. And guess what? This was super simple. 
I wouldn't say it was that easy, but you don't actually have to run to avoid anything here. There's maybe one attack that is unavoidable if you're walking, but since you can afford to take one hit, you know, who cares? With that, you throw his dumb ass into the island's trash can and successfully complete Donkey Kong Country 2 without running, with a grand total of three levels that were impossible to complete. Fun fact, originally I had about nine levels down as probably being impossible, but with the addition of super jumps and better planning, it was whittled down to only Crockhead Clamber, Ghostly Grove, and Screech's Sprint. I offer them to you, wonderful viewers. If you want to try them, I'd be thrilled if you could actually do it. Maybe there's some tricks I don't know about that could have solved the puzzle. But before I go, let me talk about the final trick in my big bag, one that I didn't even implement at all. The wrong warp and the beetle clash, or whatever names the speedrunners put to these particular concepts, but let me explain. Using beetles, you can perform a trick that makes the game think you're holding something when in fact you're holding nothing. So say you're holding nothing, just air, as you can see. Now, if you throw this air, the game will still have an idea of what you should be holding stored in memory. The only trick is, as you load new things by moving around, the game interprets that you're holding something different now. So instead of a beetle, you can pick up and throw a warp barrel, for example. The speedrun utilizes this trick, and it's so particular that if you do something incorrectly, you can completely destroy your copy of DKC2. Because the RAM can be corrupted if you throw something that is not intended to be thrown, and therefore the game will try and load something impossible. The good news is that this can be fixed by A, being on an emulator, so who cares, and B, pulling out the save battery on your DKC2 cartridge, which wipes the saves. No saves means no memory to have been fucked up. So my point is, I thought maybe you could use this trick for some cool effect on these levels, but I don't know enough about the process to even try it. I'm fairly positive that you cannot perform this trick at all on Screech's Sprint, but the other two levels, I think it's doable. For me though, this is where I left it, with the regrettable belief that you cannot complete the DKC2 walking only challenge. I am a Neanderthal fuck and I suck. Good night.